G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy for yet another trade update. Like I said, it's just about that point where it's becoming daily and uh, we had some moves go through today. I think today was the first day free agents could actually have their paperwork lodged and therefore uh, moves were made and as a result, some compensation picks dropped and I want to talk about that in this video because there are some implications that affect every single team and a number of relatively high profile deals have also been affected. Um, you know, We'll get into that specifically. So we got some deals done. I think six free agents moved clubs this this year we're still waiting on one uh, we're not sure if that's going to happen a hundred percent and then we'll talk about some pick swaps that uh, are potentially on the agenda and a little bit of an update on a few players and a few players that we thought might leave are not leaving so it's a bit to uncover let's get into it so we'll start with the the moves that happened today so we'll start with the low-key ones that do not affect the draft order as such so he had nick haynes join carlton on a one-year deal we knew that was happening Elliot Himmelberg has joined the Gold Coast Suns, that was reported a little while back, uh, on a three-year deal. So that, that was probably a little interesting. Uh, he's an under-restricted free agent, so he just signs the sun, uh, to the Suns. And um, I suppose I, I, it makes sense with the Suns losing Lukosius, replacing him with a, a cheaper tall forward. Three-year deal's fairly handy for a player like Himmelberg. I mean, that's a pretty good deal for him. I suppose, on the one hand, it implies that they rate him. And uh, secondly, maybe that's also the cost of trying to get a player who is not from Queensland to move interstate from Adelaide. But either way, just another deal that happened today. And then Tom Campbell also signed with Melbourne as they look to get some ruck depth, which they desperately need. So good, good move from Melbourne there. We'll talk about the ones that do affect the draft order. So these are the three high-profile deals. Three players moved this year on six-year deals. So Josh Battle joined Hawthorne. We knew this was coming, but this is now formalized. And the biggest story out of this that has big draft implications is St. Kilda get pick eight. And uh, that is a pretty good deal for a free agent. I mean, we can discuss that and the system, uh, but St. Kilda, a very handy result there. In my mock drafts that I've been doing, I've been pretty much adding pick eight for Josh Battle into that mix. So St. Kilda have two picks in a row there. There'll be a watch on what do they do with those? Do they hold them? Do they do two mids? Do they go one mid and a tall? Do they split? Do they move up the order? There's so many options there. Uh, but St. Kilda, that's a great position for them to be in, even if it comes at the cost of a good player. Harry Perryman joined Collingwood on a massive deal. Um, and they got banned one compensation in the end, which, um, yeah, it's just interesting. This new wave of, of free agents that move clubs. And Harry Perryman's a good player. But you bet generally band one, you'd think, is brought in to reflect the best players on a team. And Perryman is a good player without being one of GWS's best. So they get band one compensation, the absolute max you can get. And that comes out about peak 15. So there's some discussion around why is Josh Battle worth peak eight and why is Harry Perryman pick 15. Well, first of all, it's tied to the, the ladder position of the team, if you probably already worked that out. And the idea is to, to add a layer of protection to teams that are terrible and down the bottom of the ladder losing their best player. The protection on them is greater than, say, if the best team in the league loses their best player. So people often reference Lance Franklin um, as a free agent. When Hawthorne lost him to Sydney, they got about pick 19. So band one at the end of the first round or at the end of Hawthorne's pick. So it was 18 and 19 they essentially went into that draft with, or I don't know if they traded them, I can't remember off the top of my head. However, not long after that, when Hawthorne joined, uh, signed James Frawley from Melbourne, I think Melbourne were compensated with pick three. And this is a reflection of the fact that Melbourne were less equipped to deal with losing a key player who is nowhere near as good as Lance Franklin, but it's an extra layer of protection so that the top clubs, when they poach the bottom team's best players, which invariably happens, the teams that are doing poorly uh, get a little bit more back. So one example is obviously Ben Mackay last year with North Melbourne getting pick three for that. It does throw up some quirky results like that and clubs will in inevitably game the system a little bit. So Essendon will offer an inflated contract to Mackay because they could afford it at the time with the salary cap going up. However, in that scenario, if North Melbourne had matched the uh, the offer for Ben Mackay, it would have forced a trade and they wouldn't have got as much back. So it's, it's quirky, but I will note that when Hawthorne lost Lance Franklin and that yes, they only got pick 19 back, they also won the next two premierships. So as far as losing players go, I think Hawthorne did just fine out of that. Had Hawthorne rolled down the ladder, even though it's not fair, I know, but had Hawthorne rolled down the ladder, you'd have a stronger case to make that it's not fair if they only get pick 19. Well, in that case, it really didn't matter. So it's just an extension of the rich being taxed more than the poor, I suppose. Uh, and uh, we also mentioned Isaac Cumming, this got down done for band two compensation. So. Everyone moves back in the order. GWS get what I think is effectively pick 21 in this year's draft. So 
On the side note, Jack Rame is one free agent, I think, we that is left that we don't have an answer on. Um, there's been mix, mixed reporting on that. It said he was set to join West Coast. He has toured there. However, he hasn't like nominated them yet. And I believe that he actually toured Port Adelaide a year ago or two years ago before eventually re-signing with Richmond. So it's possible nothing happens there. I'd imagine it's not banned one or two compensation for Jack Graham, so it's unlikely to affect the first couple of rounds. I'd be surprised if it's a band two compensation. Very surprised, actually, but we'll see what happens there. So let's just touch on how these compensation picks are going to affect current deals. So you can make your own mind up as to whether this massively affects them, but I will note that Shea Bolton was originally going to um, Fremantle for 9 and 17. It's just worth noting that is now 10 and 18. And it's not moving back because of an academy bid, um, which is a little bit different. They are legitimately going to be picking later at 10 and 18. Hawthorne's first pick is now pick 14. This impacts the Tom Barris deal and potentially the Liam Baker deal because the suggestion is out in the media. Hawthorne's first pick gets to West Coast. West Coast flipped that for Liam Baker. So this really affects Richmond. If you, if you follow that train of thought, it's not going to stop Tom Barris being traded to Hawthorne. And it's unlikely to mean that Richmond rejects pick 14 from West Coast. However, in this scenario, so far, Richmond have probably been the most hard done by because what was originally 9, 13, and 17 is now 10, 14, and 18. We also saw this coming, but Geelong's first round pick was 15. It is now 17, and that affects the Bailey Smith deal. So there's going to be a lot to play out there, but it doesn't help Geelong's case that this has also moved from 15 to 17. They are probably already anticipating that, but it's worth noting. And Gold Coast pick, which I want to talk about now, has been the subject of a lot of discussion around who's going to trade for it. So pick 12, as it was, is now pick 13. We know that Gold Coast don't really need this pick because it's likely to get absorbed by a bid for Leonardo Lombard, their academy first round prospect. So we'll talk about some clubs that are apparently angling from it. There's a, there's a heap. Collingwood and Carlton are described in the in a latest article as being right in the thick of it. So for Collingwood, they wanna make this part of the John Noble deal. He has requested a trade to the Gold Coast Suns. They're not gonna trade pick 13 for Noble outright, but Collingwood's future first round pick is likely to get absorbed by, is it Tom McGuan? Um, a father-son for Collingwood in next year's draft. He was a first-round pick. So Collingwood suddenly don't need that first-rounder. They could be right in the thick of this with trading that future first and essentially getting pick 13 uh, as part of a John Noble deal. And we know that Carlton is also trying to get their hands on it. Um, obviously, they're, they're right in the thick of it with Dan Houston and Port Adelaide. It doesn't sound like those negotiations are going particularly well, but Carlton's determined to hold on to their existing pick 12. It was pick 11, is now pick 12, to keep a presence in this year's first round. They've got some father-sons after that. But if Carlton can somehow wiggle pick 13 loose, they can then on-trade it to Port Adelaide. And there is still no guarantee that Port Adelaide are even going to say yes to pick 13, considering Houston is contracted and said he's happy enough to stay at Port Adelaide for another year. So as I said in yesterday's video, if Carlton pissed Port Adelaide off, Port Adelaide could go to Houston and say it's North Melbourne or nothing, which could be North Melbourne's avenue to getting Dan Houston this year, but we'll see. Melbourne is right in the thick of it, uh, offering their future first round pick for the Suns uh, pick 13 this year. Melbourne's current first round pick is pick five. Um, so they'll obviously back themselves in trading into a, arguably a stronger draft. The Suns would have to be wary there. The Melbourne could bounce back. They could. I, I, I could see them being, you know, top four to top six again on list talent. There's a lot to play out with Melbourne there. So it's just a gamble from Gold Coast's point of view there, and they might think it's not worth it. Sydney have picks 19 and 22 now after all those academy picks, and they could trade up to get 13. I'm not too sure what their motivation would be. Equally with the Giants now, they've got 15, 16, and 21. Would they bother trading up to 13? Uh, maybe they'll have some later picks in the 20s they could package. Again, it's hard to see who the leading contender here is for this pick, but it could be Collingwood because Gold Coast are somewhat attached to John Noble. They could bow out of that deal, but there is some impetus for them to actually deal with Collingwood in the first place. Uh, the Dogs are also a club that are linked to the pick swap. It doesn't say how. They've been attacking the draft really hard. And as well, it does give a little tidbit here that the Dogs are still interested in Houston. I said yesterday, it seemed like it was down to Carlton and North Melbourne. That is what was reported. And then I've just seen a detail here that the Dogs are still trying to make it happen. So again, it's still very early stages. A few deals that uh, have had a bit of cold water poured on them. I did talk about Clayton Oliver quite heavily in yesterday's update. Um, Melbourne, apparently their best, best and, best and fairest, yes, at Melbourne's best and fairest. Uh, Brad Green apparently uh, in his welcome speech said that they're not gonna, it's not going to happen. So uh, I don't know what's happening there. The, the suggestion is that it was Melbourne shopping them around and now at their best and fairest, they're pouring cold water over it. Honestly, it's hard to imagine, like I said in yesterday's video, Geelong being able to get a deal done anyway. So I think Melbourne are probably realizing that this hasn't 
or is unlikely to go the, the way that they potentially hoped when they shopped around Clayton Oliver, if that's even true, but apparently it is. Also, a couple of players that are expected to stay at the Giants, um, which puts them in rare company because a lot of players are linked to moves out. So um, we know that Cumming, Perryman and Haynes have left and we know James Peatling has requested a trade. A couple of contracted players, however, um, that are likely to stay. The Giants said that um, Xavier O'Halloran and even Wade Dirksen are not going to be leaving, or at least they don't intend to at the moment. Wade Dirksen hasn't played a game yet, mid-season draftee. Uh, Melbourne um, obviously put some work in there. He's requested a trade there. I actually don't think I remembered that he was still contracted. So GWS there have the right to say, no, we're holding you to your contract. And given the instability of the team right now, uh, not the club, but you know the playing list and the, the players leaving, that makes perfect sense. Same thing with Xavier O'Halloran, he was linked to a move. At least the Western Bulldogs were asking the question and my personal opinion at the time, which has now been validated, was that the Giants can say no, he's contracted. Um, I think he played 19 games for him this year and given the other exits, it would be crazy for the Giants to shop away Xavier O'Halloran and they've already got a good draft hand. What have they got, like 15, 16 and 21? They're likely to hold those players. Connor Stone, on the other hand, uh, there's no update there, but he is out of contract, so that one could happen. And one final note, just on Joe Richards, that one has been, um, you, you know, it's kind of been a, not a stalemate, but what's the, what's the word? It's been a dead heat, I suppose, between Collingwood and Port Adelaide. Uh, I've just read an article on the AFL website he is actually more likely at this point to go to Port Adelaide, which is interesting. You can only assume being a Victorian that um, perhaps a guarantee of playtime would be one factor and, and financially, perhaps the power is offering more, although we don't know that for sure. So just a little bit of an update there. We could see Joe Richards move to the power. Anyway, guys, that is all I got for you at the moment. Again, I'll probably be doing this daily. Hope this update was helpful to you. Let me know as well what you think of the free agency compensation situation. I mean, it's annoying for all clubs to move back in the draft, but again, I think of my own club and you know, if we lost a free agent, particularly if it was a key player, I would hate there to be no compensation. I just fear for what the league would look like if it was so easy for top teams to poach bottom teams and those bottom teams didn't have any protection. I'm okay with the system around it being tied to ladder position. But if you want to eliminate that, what you could do is just move band one to end of first round compensation. So the best pick you can get is pick 19 as compensation. It's not perfect. I don't know if there's any perfect system. To be honest, I actually preferred back in the day when all you could do is request a trade to get out of a club. But these are the times we live in. Thank you for watching, guys. I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.